technologies that allow us to do kind of large and kind of small scale listening. Um, this is uh, our group at our last uh, retreat. Um, so we've got a, a group of about 16 or 17 PhD students, mainly machine learning, NLP, um, and then a, uh, a very interesting um, group of uh, people with backgrounds in uh, media and journalism, constitutional law, children's education that are part of the team. And uh, if you look carefully, you might spot a face. <laughs> 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 So first topic is uh, listening at scale via, uh, via social media. Um, so I'll just highlight one project that we did. This is uh, with, uh, in partnership with Twitter and um, uh, Knight Foundation, where we wanted to do conversational analysis of, uh, kind of English language tweets around the US election. Um, we designed uh, models to automatically detect tweets that were about the election regardless of hashtags or keywords, a kind of robust sorting from the fire hose of tweets um, that uh, <coughs> were about topics that were defined. We actually worked with the Washington Post to define um, uh, 19 issues that uh, were um, uh, expected to be prominent in the, in the conversation. Um, and I'm just going to, uh, again, just show you examples of capabilities, which I hope will spark conversation around things we might be able to do together. And certainly for Kathy and I have, have led to some, some uh, interesting ideas. Um, this was one of the first tests of using our Twitter analysis to create a story of um, uh, working with the Washington Post. Essentially, this is in December of 2015. Um, of, of just tracking the ebb and flow of kind of the relative number of tweets about different issues um, where um, you can see when there is an event, this was San Bernardino shooting, um, you could see the uh, uh, sudden jump in the conversation about issues. It could have been that race or immigration were, were also triggered by that event, so you could also start to look at kind of event driven uh, shifts in conversation. Um, there's a lot more to be said, but you know, behind this uh, picture, which is showing the kind of relative shift of attention on Twitter of different issues, are of course raw tweets, where you can go and in various ways look at the content of what people are saying. Um, and also, uh, and, oh, and uh, another interesting thing was the level of interest in going beyond polling data and focus groups as an input. We also were invited by the Commission on Presidential Debates to suggest uh, questions based on conversations that we were seeing on Twitter. So we briefed the moderators of each of the presidential, uh, uh, the three presidential and the vice presidential debate using Twitter data. So this is kind of looking at patterns in tweets. Um, what got really interesting for us was to start looking at the, the network structure uh, behind the people who are tweeting. So this is a, uh, a mutual follower graph. Uh, that shows all of the accounts that tweeted at least once about one of the issues listed along the left during the summer of 2016. Um, there's obviously uh, some, some cliques. There's no obvious correlation between the substructures in this network and the topics that, are, uh, that people were talking about or accounts were talking about. Um, but when we um, recolor this same uh, network based on what we started calling political tribes, we had a very simple definition. Um, if an account only followed one of the candidates at the exclusion of the rest that ran uh, during the presidential election, uh, we put that account into uh, the tribe. So um, this is uh, now reveals a very different structure and really gets at this notion that I, uh, we talked about this morning of kind of the fragmented nature of the network. Um, this is the Trump tribe. Um, this is actually just a visual artifact. There's uh, a very uh, densely interconnected number of accounts that follow only Trump. Um, in magenta are accounts that follow Trump and Clinton. Um, in blue, far more dispersed and lacking this structure of the Trump tribe uh, is the Clinton tribe. And interestingly, there's a third major tribe in green, which is the Sanders tribe. And this is a snapshot taken uh, after the primaries were over in fall of 2016. Um, one comment about the structure here, um, it's kind of hard to see in this, in this graphic, but there's a fair number of Sanders uh, tribe members that have mutual links, connections into the Trump tribe. And so this notion of the 
left right we've been using left right a lot uh, in conversations today but there may be a kind of at least a, a second orthogonal axis uh, more of a kind of institutionalist insurrectionist uh, uh, kind of axis but it's just interesting that there is a, a fair amount of energy in this network uh, snapshot um, that's kind of crossing over what you might call uh, <coughs> right um, <coughs> we were very struck by the lack of connectivity between the Trump tribe and the rest of the this sort of uh, um, structure. Uh, we were also tracking news coverage of the election. So we took a sample of journalists who wrote at least one story in that same period. This is in the US mainstream news. We include Breitbart uh, in, in the mainstream, uh, MSNBC, 30 organizations. We had 30,000 journalists. And we found their, um, uh, their accounts on Twitter and located them on this graph. And what you see pulsating in blue are verified and yellow unverified journalists. So it's, again, just interesting to see the uh, absence of any of these journalists in the Trump tribe. Not surprising. We probably wouldn't want to or expect to find journalists who only follow Trump, only are listening to Trump during the, the election. But this notion of uh, a, a kind of narrative that we learned about in the press that seemed pretty disconnected from a part of the country. We, we felt like we were looking at a, a picture of that. Um, just one more, this is something I just threw in uh, after uh, listening to the morning, this notion again of uh, understanding the left-right. Uh, this diagram is showing each circle is the media source, and its location in the triangle is driven by how many people in each of these three tribes shared um, uh, articles from uh, those sources. So it's a kind of looking at the media flow to identify locations. So you get a, uh, a major axis, which is left-right uh, orientation. CNN is pretty central, much more clustered um, for uh, 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 sources on the right than the left. Um, <clears throat> but it is interesting to look, oh, and platforms, very strong right-leaning bias of YouTube uh, compared to Twitter uh, in terms of content shared. And, um, and then it's interesting to find media sources that are shared by Clinton and Sanders tribe members, but virtually never by Trump. Bill Moyers is an example. Um, and then you can ask, what about media sources that are shared by Trump and Sanders tribe members, but l rarely by Clinton? Um, RT pops up. Uh, so uh, it's sometimes interesting, we, we found to, rather than map things into a left right, instead just keep uh, keep the segment boundaries and look through that lens. Do you know were all these accounts real, particularly the Trump accounts? Were they real people, or did you? Yeah, we've we've used um, a couple of different bot detectors to to filter pretty aggressively to see if the patterns uh, persist, and they um, they do. And so uh, it, it seems, um, and actually this this is relevant in the study as well, where um, the presence of bots seems to accelerate, but at least the patterns we've been studying seem to persist even when you do aggressive filtering. Um, I'll mention one more, and I think I'm almost al already out of time, I realize. So um, this is a, a study <coughs> that we've been working on actually for a few years where we scraped uh, six fact-checking organizations, found all the contested news stories comprehensively uh, from these databases, and then identified retweet cascades that were actually tweeting about the, s the news stories that were contested and then later uh, either confirmed or denied by the fact-checking organizations. So we actually uh, completed uh, what we think is the most comprehensive study of its kind, 126,000 of these cascades over a decade. And we asked a simple question, which is, is there a difference in the diffusion properties of true versus uh, false uh, news. So I'm just going to show you one image. This is actually what these cascades look like. Uh, and anyone want to guess which one is false and which one is true? This is kind of representative uh -huh. of the actual. So it was kind of like this truth, you know, versus falsity fighting it out. And uh, and unfortunately, in this case, the yellow is the uh, false piece of information. So this, this image will actually be on the cover of Science this coming week. So I, I wanted to share more, but they, I've been learning how aggressively uh, we are embargoed and talking about results. But the, the kind of punchline is falsity uh, travels uh, significantly faster, further, and deeper 
than True News. And we did aggressive bot filtering to see whether this was a, 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 you know, a result of bots or was this a result of big influential accounts and it turns out to be neither are the case. It's millions, this, the, the data behind this is millions of individuals with small numbers of accounts. We just, uh, uh, as humans in a networked environment, uh, tend to favor false news over, over true. And um, <coughs> the differences are not subtle. It's uh, sometimes approaching order of magnitude depending on what you measure. So we think um, uh, this study is, is pretty significant in, in kind of uh, um, the implications. Um, we started a little late, Deb, so you've got Okay. Time. So let me um, just share with you something interesting that's kind of late-breaking. This was yesterday. Jack Dorsey is um, co-founder and CEO of Twitter, and yesterday he tweeted what is called a tweet storm, um, a, a, a series of tweets. The, if the, the opening tweet is, <coughs> reads as follows, we're committing Twitter to help increase the collective health, openness, and civility of public conversation, and to hold ourselves publicly accountable towards progress. And there's like 13 tweets in here. One of them, my favorite, uh, is, is, oops, was right there, where he actually uh, refers to, so Cortico, uh, is a nonprofit that grew out of uh, that, that picture I showed you at the beginning was actually two teams uh, our lab at MIT and a nonprofit uh, technology company that has been uh, incubated, sort of grew out of our research lab that's Cortico. Um, and um, uh, so Twitter has adopted our framing of a way to think about sort of the health of public conversation, the health of the public sphere. Um, and uh, we, we have been working with this idea of uh, four principles, shared attention, shared reality, variety of opinion, and receptivity uh, as principles that might guide empirically data-grounded metrics or indicators that could actually be computed on an ongoing basis at scale, not just on Twitter, but across uh, different communication platforms. Um, so here, here, uh, here they are again. Um, I imagine a lot of people in this room uh, would have a lot to say about whether these are the right principles uh, or how to defend them, uh, how to, um, and then how to actually start to prototype actual versions of how to measure each of these concepts with real <coughs> data on platforms. Uh, that's the work we've begun now across our lab and across Cortico, so I'd love to talk with anyone who's interested more about, about these. But the, the vision behind this is um, uh, working with a diversity of different um, uh, inputs. Um, and one that we're spending a lot of time on now is talk radio. Um, so actually, just I hope I'm not being too. Uh, this is a map of talk radio stations that blanket America. There's about 2,000 of them. Um, and it's now possible, this is actually real data, to, um, uh, by machine, ingest uh, the audio, transcribe it, do semantic analysis, and basically, if you think about um, in local, not the syndicate, but local talk radio, mm -hmm. and when someone calls in, that's the original tweet, right? In fact, in, if you want to be very accurate, that's the original ephemeral geofenced tweet pre-internet. Um, and there's a lot of that signal continuing to flow um, and in some ways, compared to internet commentary, what happens on local talk radio stays in, uh, in, in local talk radio. So we're, uh, we're turning on a large-scale ingest of talk radio to pull that in as a parallel stream. Most of the talk sh uh, radio hosts are actually on Twitter, so it's very interesting to look at kind of network structures across these. So, so what we're doing is um, uh, setting up to actually pull in every one of the uh, data types you're seeing. This is a multi-year project we're, we're uh, um, starting, starting into. And we will be prototyping these um, health indicators and start sharing them and the methods underneath uh, for how we're sharing. And, and sort of the theory of change that we're interested in is, uh, st and you saw the, uh, the uh, tweet storm from, uh, from Twitter, um, that there's kind of four stakeholder groups that we think um, each of where, which may be influenced to some degree, <coughs> credible metrics, meaningful metrics could be stood up. 
the distribution platforms, and we're, uh, we're speaking with Facebook, we're having very good conversations with them as well, um, is that there's actually things you could change in your product, in your platform, uh, to uh, encourage uh, healthier behavior if you had a way to actually measure it. Uh, we're also starting work with influencers. We have, we have a, 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 a celebrity that Kathy's met, uh, in our, uh, other than Kathy, in our, in our group. Uh, uh, but we're, we've started conversations with people that have millions of followers on Twitter or Instagram to say, and, and uh, imagine a leaderboard for talk radio show hosts that are having the most positive influence um, on the public sphere, you know, in their, in their locales. How could that actually change individual behavior? But we're also working with media companies uh, like Frontline and others to think about uh, how these metrics could affect uh, and sort of give us a different way to keep score uh, than, than reach and engagement, which is tied to advertising, right, to have a, 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 a orthogonal. Of course, advertisers and the, and the public make up the, the four groups. Um, so let me just really sketch briefly uh, the complement to listening at scale, which is why Kathy uh, was uh, hiding out in our in our picture there, which is um, we were just speaking over lunch that um, when you want to figure out who is in that Trump tribe and and what are they actually talking about, um, it's not just that you need better tools, but when you actually go and sift through the tweets themselves, you see that, and I'm sure anyone who who engages in social media here knows the experience. Um, it is the most extreme opinions that are dominating um, in, in these platforms. And most people don't sh uh, are being exposed to those, but perhaps don't share those views, or if you ask them in the right way, would say different things. Um, and so we think there's only so much you can do with those signals. So we've, we've become very interested, and this is sort of a, uh, a, a rural, uh, um, uh, some rural visits we started doing, uh, in large part inspired by uh, conversations with Kathy, um, where we've been starting conversations on the ground and uh, we're going to be working with Kathy to learn from her on how she does what she does um, but then think about a technological layer where as uh, we take interviews such as um, uh, or conversations such as the one that uh, I was a part of here in Anamosa, Iowa, uh, we've been designing um, sort of power tools and I'm, I'm definitely over time now so I'm not going to take you through this but this is a uh, a tool where you can load a transcript, a, uh, sorry, a speech recording um, into a tool, automatically transcribe it, and start doing analysis of the content um, and start linking the content of a, a field uh, interview. This is actually, this is some of Kathy's data here. Um, and take a, uh, take a comment or an utterance from a speech recording and automatically match it with other utterances and speech recordings. So if you have a corpus of interviews, you can start to see uh, what the patterns or themes are. Um, or suck in, and Kathy gave us a list of local news sources, and we also pulled in all the YouTube now, and we're pulling in the, the talk radio uh, to say, given some utterance in a field recording, uh, what are all the matches? Interestingly, uh, Kathy, you haven't seen this yet. Um, it, it's pulling in all letters to the editors from the local news, and it's, it's matches with kind of points of view in, in local news. So imagine um, a tool where you can take um, these kind of raw recordings and have an automatic <coughs> level of uh, analysis and con contextualization. So we think um, that's a good direction to pursue. And the last thing I'll show you is uh, something that came out of that retreat that's now real. This is called the listening box. So we've imagined, so it says there in small print, why do you work? So we're playing around with different prompts. Um, this is a box, you press, you talk to it. We, we are thinking about a human facilitator that owns the box. There's 20,000 libraries in America, so we might take aim at making 20,000 of them. We'll, we'll start with a couple. Um, and this idea of creating um, new kinds of digital networks that are based on listening uh, and that have kind of analytics in the backdrop. So there's a, a variety of ideas around creating uh, sort of um, new kinds of networks that um, is really an open-ended area that, that Kathy and I are going to be exploring over the starting of the next year. And uh, there, there's the guys who mm -hmm. built the box, uh, being recorded by the box. So um, I'd, I'd love to talk about how this fits <coughs> in with many of the themes that we, we heard today, and I'll stop there. Thank you.